Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back once again. I'm Colin Weaver. You're watching the IT Dojo CISSP Questions of the Day, where each and every time I come at you, I bring you two questions to help you continue to get prepared for your CISSP exam. Um, today's questions are brought to you by absolutely nobody. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Question number one, which of the following items that I'm gonna show you is the best way for you to control access to data when you only want users to be able to access it when they're in a particular location? There's your answer choices. Go ahead and click on pause if you need to, give us some thought when you're ready, click play, and we will talk it through. All right, this question is pretty straightforward. The answer choice that we are looking for here is attribute-based access control, or ABAC, however you wanna say that. Uh, the other options simply don't have a mechanism that would allow you to include a, a particular subject's location or a user's location. Uh, only ABAC, because it's able to go in and look at attributes like what is your current location, can go in and make a decision like that for you. Hey, real quick before we move on, I want you to know that IT Dojo does more than just the CISSP questions of the day. Uh, we are a full-blown training facility and we can put you in pretty much any course that you might need. So if your organization's looking for training that's Cisco related or Juniper related or uh, RMF related or any of the CompTIA related stuff, any of those things, uh, and then a huge long list more beyond that, uh, whether you want live in-person training or if you want to do training that is live remote online, where you're sitting in the confines of your comfortable home, still wearing your underwear from the you know, waist down and being able to go in and uh, still participate in class, uh, we can do that for you too. So um, check out our website. We offer a ton of stuff. If you don't see it on there, the chances are we can still put you in the course. So reach out and we'll hook you up. Okay, question number two today. Uh, which of the following is the most important benefit derived from a public key infrastructure? Here come your answer choices. Give us some thoughts. When you're ready, click play again. If you've clicked pause, and then we will talk it all through. Choice number one on the list says that the most important thing that you're gonna get from a public key infrastructure is data confidentiality, and that is not true. Now, this can be all kinds of confusing if you're not really feeling super good about what PKI does and does not do, which is kind of what this question is all about. Data confidentiality is something that can ultimately be achieved because of a public key infrastructure, but the public key infrastructure itself does not provide data confidentiality. The public key infrastructure provides a trust mechanism so that when you do finally get to the point of having some data confidentiality, it's actually data confidentiality with who you think it's supposed to be. Who is it that they claim to be? Yes, they are that person. Can they not deny it? No, they can't. So um, that's what uh, public key infrastructure is gonna give you. Data confidentiality is an outgrowth of that, but not the thing that the PKI itself does. Okay, the second choice, link encryption, nope. That's really kind of along the same lines as the first answer choice. While you may be able to ultimately have link encryption as the end result of some PKI processes that you did, it's not the public key infrastructure itself that's creating encryption for the link. It's simply providing you with a trusted way to go in and create a encryption between two endpoints. Choice number three, support for Diffie-Hellman key exchanges. No, you don't need a public key infrastructure to have support for Diffie-Hellman key exchanges. You can do Diffie-Hellman key exchanges in pretty much any scenario that you want to try and contemplate. You do not need a PKI to do it. In fact, it's not unusual for Diffie-Hellman key exchanges to occur, and there's no PKI in sight. So definitely not the right answer choice. Ha ha ha, now we're getting somewhere. Authentication and non-repudiation. That's what a public key infrastructure brings to the table. Because if you really break this down into its most simple, you have encryption algorithms, symmetric and asymmetric algorithms. They provide you with confidentiality. Okay, and then you have hashing algorithms which provide you with data integrity. And if you want to go in and add a measure of assurance that the person who signed this file or the person who encrypted this data is the person or the computer that you think it is, you need a third party mechanism of trust in the form of a public key infrastructure. You know, or you could do it with you know, PGP or something like that, but we're talking about PKI right now. So that's what a PKI is gonna bring you is some authentication. Uh, origin authentication, individual user authentication, computer authentication, plus it's also going to give you the sort of corollary to that, which is non-repudiation. The inability for the other side to deny they did a thing. So if you want to make sure that you can hold somebody accountable for the email message that they did, or you want to make sure that, uh, that if somebody signs some code that they're going to be accountable for the code they signed, that's what non-repudiation can bring to the table, and a PKI creates the framework for that. 
Okay, without a public key infrastructure, people can still sign code, people can still encrypt emails, but they're doing so with untrusted keys. And so your level of confidence in that information should be about zero. The only thing that you know for sure is that you are looking at a message that has been hashed and, or that you are looking at a message that's been encrypted, but you don't know who encrypted it. Okay? And you certainly can't hold them to account for it. The public key infrastructure is what brings that to the table. It brings trust to the table. And then the last answer choice on the list, data integrity. Again, no, for the same reasons. Hashing algorithms are a mechanism of integrity. If you want trust and assurance from your hashing algorithms, then you can digitally sign the hashes, um, and that's where PKI would come into play. But data integrity by itself, negative. All right, that's two questions down. That's it. I'll see you next time. Bye, Felicia.